we're in Romans chapter 7, so turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. As we continue this survey through Romans, I was telling myself today that this is a survey, this is a survey, and I only got to six verses. <laughs> My desire was to go all through chapter 7, but, you know, I just said, you know, if, if it's apparent that we need a little bit more time right here because I needed more time right there. So obviously you move as I move. And uh, we rushed through chapter 6 last week, and one of the frustrations of any kind of survey of any book is the fact that you rush through it, you generalize a lot of things. But you know, this, this is really a, a very important passage, not to say that none of it is important, because all of it is. In fact, had I started this over, I would have just went a lot slower. But as you know, I'm teaching this also in a college and I have so many weeks to work with it, so I thought, well, I would just run it with the same schedule. And so we'll just kind of see how we end up. But tonight we're going to look at chapter 7, and we're going to look at the first six verses. So if you can go ahead and turn there, and let me just take an opportunity to read those verses. Paul says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who, are, who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren... You also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit, and not in oldness of the letter. Now, last week we began this section, beginning at chapter 6, on sanctification. Sanctification is uh, <clears throat> one of those big words, but it's a very simple word that just simply means to be set apart. We are set apart to God. It's, another word would be to be holy. And this section here begins in chapter 6, and it runs all the way to chapter 8. And so when we looked at this, we said last time that Paul is now demonstrating the practical ramifications of salvation on those who have been justified. And he does that by addressing basically an objection that had been raised in chapter 5 and verse 20. If you look there in chapter 5 and verse 20, his objector said that if where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, then we should go on sinning so that we have more grace. But Paul immediately dismisses that thought, and he stated that we have died to sin. And so in chapter 6 and verse 3, he raises uh, this question. He says, how shall we who died to sin continue to live in it? It was repulsive to him to think that God's grace gave us any license to sin. We are being delivered from sin by the act of justification, by the very act of the atonement. So to think of any idea that we can continue in sin to get more grace is completely, like I said, repulsive. He uses a, a very strong negative in the Greek in chapter 6 where he says, may it never be. It's a meginatoi in the Greek. It's like perish the thought. Just get that thought right out of your mind. And then he goes on and gives us reasons why uh, we are not to continue in sin. And he gives us two rhetorical questions. And in those two rhetorical questions, he obviously gives us the answer and he gives us the argument as to why we are not to continue in sin. But like I said, he dismisses that very claim. We have been delivered from the power of sin. That's what Romans 6 is teaching, actually. And so like verse 21 says, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? And what's the answer to that is? There is no benefit from sinning. <laughs> 
You know, to some, it, it, we're enticed by the pleasure of it. I wouldn't say some, I would say all. <laughs> That's the only reason why we sin, right? We think that it promises something more or some kind of benefit there for us, so therefore we yield to it. But the thing that we need to understand is that it enslaves us. Anytime we commit sin, we are enslaved by it. And that's all it, it could derive from it. But now, verse 18 tells us that because of the righteousness of Christ that has been imputed to us, we are now slaves of righteousness. So, he tells us, Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. You have to consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so again, this is how Paul responds. He re responds with a very strong argument. He responds with two rhetorical questions, one in verse 1, one in verse 15. And now as he moves over into chapter 7, this is just really a continuation. For us, it's a chapter break. You know, to go from chapter 6 to chapter 7, and sometimes we think that just because now there's a chapter break there that we've now entered into a new subject. But that's not the case. He is continuing his thought as you move into chapter 7. This, this would be the only time that I would say that chapter breaks, you know, where you have numbers, peri all that stuff, hurts us. Because it's, you know, we, we tend to forget what the context is all about. But as he moves or continues to move through chapter 7, he continues with the idea of the Christian being dead. But now he applies it to the law. Because we are now under grace and not the law, the law no longer has any jurisdiction over us. Now look at the first three verses. We read them just a moment ago. And he begins by giving us an illustration. And he says in verse 1 that the law only applies to those who are living. It has nothing to say to a dead man. You know that's true. If, 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 if you die, everything ends right there as far as your obligations here. No one can dig you up from the, from the grave and say, listen, you owe me blah, blah, blah. You know, or the law is going to take this out on you because it never got to take this out on you because you died. You know, think of uh, the, the man who murdered John F. Kennedy. Uh, he never got a trial because he was assassinated along the way. And uh, so his obligation at that point ended. So it has nothing to say to a dead man. That's very obvious. Look at what he says. Do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? And the law that he's talking about here is any kind of law. He's not talking about just the Mosaic law. So whether it was Roman law or Greek law or even God-given biblical law, it has jurisdiction over a person only as long as he lives. If a criminal dies, he's no longer subject to prosecution. He's no longer subject to punishment, no matter how numerous or how heinous his crime is. Uh, it's over with. So to continue in that illustration of the jurisdiction of the law, he now speaks about marriage law. Look there at verse 2. And he tells us in verses 2 and 3 that marriage law binds a wife to her husband and vice versa, a husband to his wife. And he says in verse 2, For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. In other words, as long as her husband is alive, she is bound by the marriage law to him. Now, it's important to note right here in this passage because some want to use this passage to deal with the issue of divorce, and it, it actually has nothing to say about divorce. It can't be used legitimately uh, as an argument from silence to teach that divorce is never justified for a Christian, and consequently that only the death of a spouse gives the right to remarriage. Paul's point right here in this section is that marriage laws are only binding as long as both partners are alive. Again, look at verse 3. He says, So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. In other words, being joined to another man while her husband is alive makes a woman an adulteress. Therefore, it makes her an offender of the law. But to be joined in marriage to another man after her husband dies is perfectly legal and is perfectly acceptable in Scripture. In fact, a widow is absolutely free from the law that bound her to her former husband. You even find Paul encouraging the younger widow.